What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Nerd Enthusiast Wrestling Podcast. I am Chrissy e. Francesco, and joining me as always is Kyle Barone. What's going on, man? Not much. How you doing? Doing good. Doing good. Um, so uh, I'm happy to to report that this is the first show we've done in a month where we don't have to kick the show off with a wrestler death. So that's a positive. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you guys to everyone who who has listened so far to the 1997 Royal Rumble review. Um, so now it's time to go in, like we said, in an hour order, and we're going to discuss arguably the greatest Royal Rumble of all time. Um, this was the 14th Royal Rumble. Uh, it to, and to me, Barone, I mean, you can correct me if you think I'm wrong. Um, I think this is where the WWF was pretty close to its absolute best. Um, like I, I think from the period of like the 2000 rumble to WrestleMania 17 was probably the, the, the best like 15 month run in the history of the company due to just the talent on the roster, the stories they told and the matches they had. I mean, would you agree? Yeah, this was full on attitude. era, full on Austin rock era with triple H thrown in there, undertaker, Foley angle. Like, yeah, if you look top to bottom, <clears throat> this roster stacked with Hall of Famers, stacked with great in-ring guys, great characters, great personalities. So, yeah, this is probably like prime WWF. Yeah, for sure. Like a lot of the top guys were at or near their prime, uh, and they had a, a good mix of younger guys in the mid-card scene as well. Um, plus the tag team division was as deep as ever at this time. You know, as a result, you had a 2001 Royal Rumble with a stacked lineup uh, of talented wrestlers heading into arguably the biggest WrestleMania uh, in, in company history. Um, the big story going in was Steve Austin's return after missing most of 2000 with a neck injury. Uh, could he complete the comeback with a rumble win for a record third time? Um, so let's, let's head on in here and talk about the 2001 Royal rumble. Uh, so this show was used to set up the WrestleMania 17. Um, you know, in, in our opinion, and Barone have said that Barone and I have said this before in prior podcasts, WrestleMania 17 uh, could go down as the, the biggest, maybe best, you know, WWF pay per view of all time. Um, I think it's the best WrestleMania. Um, might not be my favorite. It's two. You know, I yeah. think 19 is my favorite. 19 is uh, my favorite. 17. Yeah, 17 is like a one A. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. So, um, uh, like we said, the trio of pay-per-views to start the year with this show was No Way Out. Uh, WrestleMania 17 are, are both incredible shows. And then obviously you have this Royal Rumble. Um, it's probably the best back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back, uh, pay-per-view run in, in WWE history up until this point. Uh, this show... Uh, in 2000, well, okay, when we did the 1997 Rumble, I just want to give you guys some clarity of where the business was. And, and I kind of like looking at this stuff. 1997 Royal Rumble had 244,000 buys. Awful. Uh, 1998 went to 351. 1998 or 1999, 650,000 buys. 2000 went down to 590. And then 2001, all the way up to 625,000 buys. WrestleMania 17 at that time, for the first time in company history, reached over a million buys on pay-per-view. So that kind of tells you where, where the business was in 2001. Um, it almost felt like, you know, Barone, at, at this time, man, in, in 2001, and, you know, that's when, you know, you remember vividly what was going on. I remember vividly. Whatever the WWF did was gold at that time. Yeah. Yeah, and then you look at, let's see, 2001 Rumble. We're about two months away from the purchase of WCW. Um, so there's just so much happening um, at, at, at this point. So uh, the Rumble uh, was the 14th Rumble. Uh, let's see here. It took place January 21st, 2001 at the New Orleans Arena in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, the main event was the Royal Rumble match which obviously Stone Cold Steve also won by eliminated Kane. We will get to that, obviously. Uh, the match also included Drew Carey, which was, <laughs> which was had a quite a few different spots throughout the night. But uh, uh, you could just product of the time, my man. Product yeah, of the it time. Was, <laughs> it was a great, once you like start watching the Rumble too, Drew Carey was a great reset for the Rumble. Yeah. So like, you know, the Rumble starts 
and then they get into this hardcore match in the Rumble. Yeah. So there's like a, a long spot of just like a hardcore match. Um, or no, I'm sorry, not Drew Carey wasn't the reset. Honky Tonk Man was. Right, the Honky but, Tonk uh, Man was. Yeah, Drew Carey started the hardcore stuff. That's what mm-hmm. I meant to say. Right. So like they they have this match. Drew Carey comes out. The Hardys go over, and Drew Carey is acting like he threw him out. And then Kane comes out, and like <laughs> Drew, Drew Carey like sells it great, like telling the Hardys to come back in. Yeah. And then uh, you know he eliminates himself, but um, yeah, it was a great like comedic spot thrown in there you know but uh, oh. i dug it i thought i liked it absolutely um so for, <laughs> um the undercard also feature kurt angle defending the wwf championship against triple h and Brown and i will get into that um a lot of praise are going to be it's going to be going on to a lot of people uh you know involved in, in that match and i'm sure others will will think you know we're wwe guys so we're going to praise triple h automatically but no, it's going to be well deserved. Uh, triple uh, Chris Jericho defeated Intercontinental Champion, um, the ladder in a ladder match. <laughs> because when, if you go on the network, whoever Chris Benoit it, wrestles, yeah. it doesn't even get mentioned. No, nah, they don't even put his name up there. They're just like Chris Jericho in an Intercontinental Championship match, you know, <laughs> so which close. is so weird, too. It's like, like everyone knows who Benoit is, everyone who has the network is not going to be like, surprised they see this guy and then go oh i wonder who chris ben was and google him. you know what i mean exactly like, I everyone know. knows who he is you can put his name up there you yeah know? i agree I, like they're not promoting him they don't have like top 10 chris ben matches but like when you're scrolling through a pay-per-view and you see ben versus angle like it doesn't promote the guy it's just to let you know what's there yeah so you know the fact of the matter is wwe i'm sorry to tell you but this already all happened so it's up to me, the consumer, if I want to watch a Chris Benoit match or not. Yeah, it, it, it is what it is, okay? It's it's not a big deal. I doubt highly a 10-year-old is going to go on the network and search Chris Benoit anyway. No, so you're, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, if you wouldn't mind, I'm not sure if you have any notes leading up to – I would like to kind of start with the tag team match for the WWF tag team titles. Is that good? Yeah, I don't have. I just have notes on the rumble. The actual oh, perfect. Match. Okay, so then we'll here. Uh, I'll start it off with with the tag team match. I know you just recently watched the pay per view. Uh, when I was at the gym the other night, I was doing cardio, and what I do when I'm doing cardio is I watch the WWE Network, and so I said, you know, I'm going to go watch a couple matches um, uh, on 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 this pay per view because it also helps burn time <laughs> doing cardio. Um, so the the the, the tag team match. Uh, was the Dudley Boys, uh, Devon and Bubba Ray, against Edge and Christian. Uh, they got just about uh, 10 minutes uh, in this match, and I thought it was it was great. And like we said, top of the show, man, like the tag team division was probably, I don't want to say at its absolute peak here because, you know, those late 80s, you had some incredible tag teams. Um, I think late 80s was, is like my favorite era. Yeah. Because that's what I grew up with. Right. But you had so many good tag teams back then. But now it's like, you know, back in the 80s, you'd watch like Demolition and the Powers of Pain. They'd be like, oh, this is a cool tag team match. This era, it's like that match is must see because these sure. guys are going to try to kill each other. You know, yeah. they're yeah. going to fall off something or hit each other or put each other through something. So it was a main spot you now where like before it was like, oh, a tag team match, you know, but it was like looking back. I could watch the Brain Busters and the Hearts go all day. I could watch those the, those two teams just nonstop for for an hour. Uh, I'm I'm with you on that one. Um, so what I'll say about the, this match is, um, it went like I said, literally ten minutes. Uh, I thought it could have gotten a little bit more time, but these these four guys are you know the chemistry. The second they touch is incredible. Uh, the crowd was so hot for the Dudley Boys here uh, to win those tag champs and their tag titles, and they did. And you know, really, what I just want to say about this match is a couple things. One, I think Christian overall was a much better worker than Edge. I thought yeah. Christian was so technically sound. Uh, he uh, uh, could pretty much go with a, just about anybody. Um, I, I just obviously the charisma part was probably obviously Edge, but as an overall all around worker, I just really enjoyed watching Christian go. Um, yeah, in ring Christian was better, but the overall like package, look, yeah, and he cut better promos though. 
Absolutely. And I will say also, I think Bubba Ray, man, doesn't get his due for being a worker. He was good. I mean, he was a working SOB in this match in that era. He was just so Both good. Those guys were. Devon was a good worker too. Yeah. Um, yeah, but Bubba Ray's not like the. I don't know. He gets kind of glossed over, like you said. He doesn't get the the credit he's due for as sure. good of a because he was a tag team guy. You know, yeah. when you look at great workers, it's always like a singles guy. But yeah, he could go. Bubba Ray could go. Did you watch his uh, bully race stuff at Impact? Yeah, How I was liked that? it. I thought it was good. Um, when he came back, he was really trimmed down and, and jacked up. Mm-hmm. Like he actually took it serious, got in the gym. Um, a lot of people shit on aces and eights. I liked it. I liked it. I thought it was cool. It was different. And, you know, you saw it coming a mile away when they had that match where uh, um, Bully Ray came out as the leader of aces and eights. But I thought it was great, you know, where mm-hmm. he's like, he looks at Hogan. He's like, I screwed you. He looks at Brooke Hogan. He's like, and I screwed you because he was supposed to be dating her. Or whatever. Yeah. But uh, oh, yeah, so I thought good. that was good stuff. Impact was good during that era. It really was. When you look back now, they were pulling the same ratings that Raw gets. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, I mean, at the end of the match, the Dudley boys win with a 3D. How badass of a finisher was a 3D? It, it's the greatest, in my opinion, it's the greatest tag team finisher of all time i agree that and the doomsday device the doomsday device looked like it hurt i so, really can't believe no one has died from a doomsday device <laughs> like, <laughs> the guy taking that bump had to know like i better flip with this or i'm gonna break <laughs> my neck so like that it just looked painful but uh i love the the three day because going through the tables and everything it's an rko it's an assisted rko basically right. but yeah, i love that move i think it's great uh, it was great when they did it to like Edge, Christian, or Matt, or Jeff, because those guys got so high up in the air, and the yeah. impact was so good. Um, so yeah, congrats there. Uh, but the Dudley Boys, I think, won their second um, WWF tag titles uh, right here. Um, so like I said, it was ten minutes, um, and then in the following this one, man, the WWF gave the the crowd no chance to settle down as they went right into Chris Jericho against Benoit, a ladder match. Uh, for the WWF Intercontinental title, just under 19 minutes, man. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you, Barone. I didn't remember this one so much. And then when I watched it, it was outstanding. I think it's one of the best one-on-one ladder matches I've seen in, like, in history of, the, of that company. Yeah, it's up there in like the top three or five. I agree. You know, I'd have to like search for something better than it. But yeah, one-on-one. It's the phenomenal. Like, look who's in it. It's Jericho and Benoit. Yeah, they beat the they're piss dudes, out of each other. And these dudes had great chemistry. They were friends. They knew each other for a long time. So they worked well together. You can't go wrong with those. That's This is that mid-card worker section at WWF mm-hmm. that was so good at this time. Mm-hmm. In 2001, Chris Jericho and Chris Benoit are mid-carders. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. Um, it was probably the first like match of the year contender quality match for both guys in their WWE careers. Um, I wouldn't say it was obviously match of the year, but I'm just saying, you know, it was definitely should have been a contender. Uh, they did a great job of using the ladder as a weapon. They use ring psychology. Well, Benoit, you know, worked in the left shoulder of Jericho throughout the match. And it was ultimately, um, you know, the baby face Jericho at the time who came back from, from that attack um, to win the match. It was also interesting how they, they only used one ladder in the entire match. Um, and we know, obviously it's a car crash when you watch ladder matches, um, how, how, how some uh, wrestlers would use like three to four or five, but they kept using the same ladder. Um, it wasn't about the climb or cr- it wasn't about the climb. I wrote that and I'm just thinking it's a Miley Cyrus song. Um, it wasn't <laughs> about the climb or the crazy spots. It was really about the story, um, which tells me and, and me, cause uh, I'm, I'm a story nerd. I'm a wrestling nerd. So that's why I put it up there as a top three or four uh, ladder matches of all time. Um, and Brum, because I just told a great story. Those two, you know, they 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 were WCW guys. They worked together, I believe, in Japan. You know, they they were best friends. Like they just they had ridiculous chemistry. Yeah, they knew each other so well. Where I guarantee they don't lay anything out. It was just call it in the ring, and it comes out like that. Mm-hmm. No, I I agree. Um, 
after this, uh, just to let you guys know, in the Royal Rumble, there's only like four matches, four or five matches. Then you have the Rumble because the Rumble is always about an hour or so. So um, in a singles match for the WWF Women's ta- uh, Championship, Ivory defeated uh, China. Yeah, figure that one out. Um, but uh, China, man, this was like, you know, prime China. She looked damn good um, at this Rumble, didn't she? Yeah, this is where she wasn't. I'm actually just started listening to the the uh, JR podcast on China, where this is where she was like trimmed out off the gas. Yeah, yeah, not as jacked up as she used to be. But uh, yeah, it's I didn't even watch it the other day when I watched this pay per view. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this was like you know peak China. It was. Yeah, she she was great. I also was a big fan of her theme music. It was good. Um, she came out with this like this pyrotechnic, you know firework launcher whatever the hell it is um pretty cool stuff um all right so this is where we can get into the meat and potatoes uh, of this 2001 uh royal rumble uh a great underrated rivalry that does not get talked about enough is the kurt angle triple h rivalry um at this time kurt angle is um literally on the most prolific meteoric 12 month you know, rocket power career up until, you know, Brock Lesnar in the following year or so. Kurt Angle, man, within 12 months, probably had a Hall of Fame career within a a year. Yeah. (laughs) Um, You know, he's coming in here as the champion uh, going up against Triple H, who was Hunter was a heel here, correct? Yeah. They were, I mean, they both were kind of heels. It was Uh, one of those, like, Angle was like a, uh, I don't know, when he was babyface, he was still, yeah, tweener. Yeah, there you go. Um, but tweener. I think Triple H was full on heel here. Yeah. He was kind of feuding with Austin at the time. Yeah, this is prime Triple H because he was jacked um, uh-huh. at this point. Um, so, you know, this was a singles match for WWF Championship. Uh, Kurt Angle defeated Triple H in just under 25 minutes. Um, yeah, man, you know, I texted this to you the other day after I watched the match, and I think the most underrated worker of all time, as crazy as this sounds, is Triple H. And He's it's, the most underrated in-ring guy because a lot of people don't look at, like, how good he was bell to bell, like I said. Where, you know, we talked about it the other day how – Whenever you bring up Triple H, everyone's like, he only has a success because he's married to Steph. And I said to you, I was like, dude, he was in creative meetings in 1997 with yes. Shawn Michaels. You know, mm-hmm. they were invited into those meetings way before Steph was even like in the building. So to say like he only has his success because of Stephanie is bullshit. Um, he has, he's had a mind for the business forever. Mm-hmm. Um and again, if Vince doesn't like it, he doesn't give a fuck who's pitching the toe. He's not going to do it. Right. So even if Steph's like, come on, daddy, he's going to be like, ah, oh, no, get the fuck out of my office. He doesn't care yeah. who you are. Yeah. So, but yeah, and- Triple H, like our list we had, he's my number two. I love his matches. I love everything about the character and his career top to bottom is great. Oh, I, I, I agree. And, you know, he, He's just he's damn near a perfect worker. And and what I mean by that is, you know, he sells like a machine and has, you know, phenomenal comebacks for either a heel comeback or a baby face comeback. And he literally can work any style with anyone. And what I love most uh, uh, about Hunter and, you know, Sean did this a lot is he works and Kurt Angle did this. Actually, he will work your match, not his. So he'll, that, yeah. and that's what a ring general is. And that's basically, you know, Hogan did it too, because Hogan's job was to feed his own comeback. So mm-hmm. he has to work your style because yeah. Ultimate Warrior is not going to work Hogan's style. Uh, Randy Savage wasn't going to be able to work. So Hogan had to work their style. Mm-hmm. And that's what was so perfect um, about Triple H. I remember you, you texted me and you did it right. You said you've, you know, you've never see you'll never see Triple H phoning it in either. He would sell for everyone from Hogan to Austin and would even sell for like referees. Yeah. Like you, there's that one spot where Earl Hebner pushes him. Um, not in this match, when um I think it was when Jericho pinned him with the fast count. Yes. And yep. Earl Hebner pushes him and he sells the push. 
Earl Hefner is like the size of my daughter. You know what I mean? And <laughs> Triple H is this big jacked up guy. But him selling that push added to the story. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so yeah, he would have like this, he'd go out there and tear the house down with Austin or The Undertaker. But he'd also have a good match with like Eugene or something yes. like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where he never like, he took every match seriously in the ring. He took it all seriously. Uh, yeah, I 100% agree with you. And another thing, and to, you know, that, that's where I said, you know, my, my two notes here is Triple H is maybe the most underappreciated and underrated worker of all time. And the next thing I wrote is Kurt Angle is the most natural worker I've ever seen. Um, yeah. And, you know, you always hear people say, you know, JR says, the other, <laughs> other than JR reminding everyone 17 times a week that he signed everybody on Mankind. But the second thing he always says, you know, this is pro wrestling. It's not something that you could pick up overnight unless you're Kurt Angle. Yeah. <laughs> so Kurt Angle picked it up in like an hour. He's like, oh, I can yeah. do this. Yeah. I, it, it, you know, I remember the, I remember the story that Bruce Pritchard told. I remember way back when his podcast first started and he was talking, they did a show on Kurt Angle. And they were talking about he came into the, I guess it was maybe the, the Funkin' Dojo with Sean Stasiak. Stasiak is a second generation worker. His dad was, it was a really good worker. But the thing is, Stasiak couldn't really take flat back bumps or couldn't do roll bumps. Where Kurt Angle is an Olympic gold medalist, fresh off of winning a gold medal in mat wrestling, starts coming in and takes to the mat literally instantly without basically any training. Yeah. And he literally and adapted. showing people how to do it. Right. Which um, is crazy. It was just insane, man. Uh, I thought the match bell to bell to to use a, a Barone term, bell to bell, man. That that match was absolutely spectacular. Um, you probably could. I mean, we couldn't literally. We probably couldn't find a, a single thing wrong with that match. I thought the finish was good. Um, you That's know, another st- thing about Triple H back then, he, he never botched. No, there was never. not a whole lot of like now. Yeah. When you have these 50 year olds wrestling, that doesn't count. Right. But when you go back into his prime, um, if there was a box, you really didn't notice it, mm-hmm. but it wasn't like as frequent as it was with other guys, you know? Mm-hmm. So he was, and, yeah, he was great in the ring. And I, I, love his <laughs> I know I I'm with you, dude. I watch triple H matches all the time. And uh, you know, I, 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 I can't stand her now. And I didn't stand her for a long time, but dude, how good was Stephanie McMahon in this era. She See, was the, a heat-seeking missile. And I say this all the time because I can't stand her either, which mm-hmm. means she's doing her job. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's, I didn't like her back then, and I don't like her now. And that means she's doing her job. She has great things off camera with charities and stuff like that. But I fucking hate when she's on screen. <laughs> and it means she's doing a great job. She's great at that. You know, sometimes it's like, dude, you're trying to be your dad like comment pull back a little bit Mm -hmm. but uh yeah she's a great heel yeah and so my analysis of this match is you know this was a really good match from two of the best superstars you know ever obviously uh hunter was at his absolute best and angle was already amazing like we said in, in the beginning of in the early parts of his career um i think doing a heel versus heel match is difficult but they made it fun and entertaining while also you know going you know long over almost 25 minutes there were times when the crowd wasn't exactly reacting to the match, although it did pick up big time in the end. Um, the spot with Stephanie and Trish worked very well um, because the intensity really picked up from that point. The finish was cheap with Austin getting involved due to his, his, you know, his long-term storyline at that point uh, with Hunter. That would lead to an amazing match at No Way Out in 2001 uh, that we all remember and love. I just watched that match last week, actually. Um, it also protected Hunter by having him take it by by not having him take a clean loss. Um, to me, it's okay to have non finishes to further other stories. I don't like non finishes for the sake because you couldn't be creative enough to come up with a finish. Um, yeah, you just uh, do a run in a DQ. Right. Come on, uh, figure it out. I, I agree. Um, overall, just a, a phenomenal match. Um, it was weird to see Austin get involved, knowing that after this match is the Rumble. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not going to criticize really any booking um, at that at that time. Um, all right, so we're, we, we're here, man. We're at that time. Uh, this is the specialty of Baroon. He writes down notes of the Rumbles. Um, I go <laughs> over all the BS that you just heard, and the show goes to Baroon for the Rumble. Um, 
going into this match, man, Austin was clearly the favorite to win and the most popular pick. He missed a year, obviously, with that neck surgery. Awful, awful neck surgery. Um, he came back three months earlier than expected, and it just made sense for him to win this Rumble to get back on that road to WrestleMania. Um, what were your thoughts, you know, Barone, before we get into the Mania? Talk about Austin, man. You know, he was riding high, man, 98, 99, 2000. Then he gets hurt. He's out for, you know, almost a year. Um and then when he came back, a lot of people say maybe he necessarily wasn't the same. I still think he was the hottest guy in the business. But, you know, what was your thoughts on on that returning Austin? Uh, I mean, it's Austin, so it's yeah. good. <laughs> uh, the crowd's always going to love it. Uh, his He's had, like, two hard runs get stopped with injuries. Yeah, I mean, like, when Owen broke his neck, he was, like, on his way to the main event scene and that happens. And then now he's in the main event scene and he gets hurt again. You know, it's a, uh, it sucks, but Hey, that's the business type deal. Um, at least we got a bunch of good backstage stuff out of this one. Oh uh, yes. Or no, that was after this. I'm sorry. After, after yeah. This. Yeah. When he got hurt again mm-hmm. later on, all the backstage stuff with uh, Vince and Kurt Angle, but um, yeah, it's, I mean, him coming back is always a good thing. Mm-hmm. But with him out, it gave like a lot of other people to rise and get their spot, like the Rock, Triple H, under like Undertaker and all. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It, it opened up the door for a lot more guys to be that main event in that main event spot. So it wasn't bad for the business. And Austin comes back, and now he has all these new guys he can feud with. For sure, um, man. I really wish Austin would have been around for like two thousand three, four, five, with all the. You know, that was probably, like you said, WrestleMania 19, Austin's on his way out. That's the most stacked roster I've ever seen was that yeah. 2003. Like, top to bottom, dude, 2003 WrestleMania, Hall of Fame. The top mm-hmm. to bottom, that pay-per-view. The whole um, card. Yep, it was unreal. Um, so uh, you have a couple notes um, on, on this Rumble. Where would you like to start? So right in the beginning, um, first three guys, I think, ends up with Hardy versus Hardy. Mm-hmm. So you got the brothers in there, which is like, you know, they do the little fist bump. So it's like, all right, let's do this, you know? So that's kind of cool. And you get two great botches out of these two in this match. <laughs> the, there's a great poetry in motion that Jeff fucks up where he slips when he jumps off his back. Yes. And then there's the other one, the drop kick to the back that doesn't land. And like a second later, they react to it. Like, oh, he kicked me, you know? So those two had two great botches in this, but uh, unbelievable. Yeah, the Hardy versus Hardy thing was cool, and then you get like you know a couple other guys thrown in there, but no one really cared. And then Drew Carey comes out to like you know a laughable pop. Um, <laughs> so he's in there. The Hardys both fall over, and then Kane comes out. And dude, this was prime <laughs> Jack to the fucking gills, Kane. He's a he mutant back then, so- man fucking big here when you see him walking down the aisle it's where he has the tank top mm-hmm. type outfit and his arms are just enormous you know yeah. um it's like yeah, trap this city is, this is prime jack fucking king so uh <laughs> but yeah after king comes out uh it turns into a hardcore match because then mm-hmm. raven comes out al snow comes out and they throw a trash can full of shit in the ring and mm-hmm. the bowling ball so it's like you have the start of the rumble then you have this like mini hardcore match which is cool. And then like after the hardcore match, you get another rumble. So, and the hardcore match starts and ends with like two kind of comedy spots. Like Drew Carey comes out and then like all the hardcore stuff goes for a while. King clears house. And then the honky tonk man returns, uh, (laughs) which was great. Um, And like that right there was such a great reset to the match. Mm -hmm. That's the reset I was talking about. We're like, he comes out, he starts singing his song. King crushes him with the fucking guitar. The, uh, guitar. That's definitely a working guitar because he fucking he cracked the shit out of him with it. That's a working so he guitar. He gets eliminated. Yeah. <laughs> he gets eliminated, and then they kick everything out, and then like the rock comes out. Yep. So now you got like a real match coming, you know, mm-hmm. and it's another big pop. And now the rest of the rumble can go on, which I thought was like a a good series there. You know what I mean? Like it gave mm-hmm. you a little mini match inside the match and then uh, another one i had taz comes out so taz debuts the year before at 2000 <laughs> wrestles kurt angle 
gets one of the biggest pops you'll ever hear Mm -hmm. when his music hits. Um, Ends Kurt Angle's undefeated streak. A year later, he lasts seven seconds. (laughs) He comes out. King, I think it's King, grabs him by the neck, puts him on the top turnbuckle, and kicks him out. It's literally a seven-second fucking, you know. Couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Yeah, you (laughs) see where Taz's uh, career went in one year. Yep. um, (laughs) uh, Another note I had, Big Show makes a massive return to a good pop. Yeah. He comes out, chokes slams the shit out of everybody, and then he's out of there a minute 23. Yep. So it's it's like impossible. Remember, return. it's always impossible to eliminate the big show. <laughs> I fucking hate Michael Coe for, for that. Every year, it's how are you going to eliminate this guy? Well, it's happened 12 times. Shut the <laughs> fuck up. I can't stand that. So, but yeah, Big Show comes out. and uh, big, big Show pop, looked good. He looked he good did. here. Yeah, this was, yeah. I think, right when he had like liposuction a little bit before that. Yeah, this is probably one of the breaks he took where they were like, dude, you got to lose weight. Yeah. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, he comes out and choke slams fucking everybody. And then I think The Rock throws him out. I think that's mm-hmm. who it was. Um, but yeah, he's eliminated in a little over a minute. Great return. Um, Solid. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then, you know, the match goes on. You got everyone else coming in. Austin, Undertaker, like all those guys. Uh, my favorite part, and one of like the most badass stare downs in yep. wrestling history, is The Rock and Austin. Where The Rock's bleeding, or Austin's bleeding, he's in the corner. And the rocks in the other corner, and you see them look at each other and just sit there. And they slowly both get up. And as they get up, you can hear the crowd start to rumble. Yeah. And Austin's like looking down with that sinister looking blood all over his face. Yep. And then they go at it. It's just a fucking like talk about telling a damn story. I was just about to say they're continuing that story. Yeah. They've had yep. been going on since the intercontinental uh title match like matches they had fucking four years ago. Yep. And so, that, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say it's it's great story. Oh yeah, three, two of the best. So here we go. Here here's my write down uh, of this. So the final four are Rock, Kane, Gunn, and Austin. <laughs> Which one of these are not like the other? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, Billy. Um, Gunn actually hits the Fame Master on Austin, but then Austin quickly throws him out, leaving us with just three. Now that's a little bit better. Uh, the crowd <laughs> freaks out as Austin and The Rock lock eyes on each other, and Austin's face is a bloody mess. Um, and here's definitely your WrestleMania preview: uh, a spit punch by The Rock that Austin completely oversells, but I love it. Um, <laughs> Austin Austin elbows his way out of The Rock bottom and hits a stunner that The Rock, as always, oversells like a mother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I always love how The Rock. So I think he sold it the best. Um, he, there's he and better, Shane. like, there's way better working cells. Like, yeah, like Shane sold it and he fucking took it great and just laid yeah. there. But yeah. the rocks oversells are fucking classic. I love oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, Austin hits the Luthez press, um, on Kane, uh, to a huge pop. Austin goes for a clothesline on the rock, but the rock comes back with a rock bottom. The rock throws Kane out through the middle rope, so he's still in the match, living us. Uh, with Rock and Austin again. Austin's close to dumping him out, so The Rock rakes his eyes. JR is losing his mind um, <laughs> at, at this point, and it's he, you can hear his voice is starting to go. Um, Rock holds this is up JR's Austin. best, like, oh, I agree he, with you 100%. He fucking loved his job so much. Yep, I know. He loved wrestling and he loved calling it. And you could tell, like, he got into fucking everything. Yep. And you could tell it was his real emotion, too. Like, him. Oh, yeah going along with it but oh yeah his calls in this era were fucking great oh i agree uh rock holds austin up in a body slam position so kane sneaks in and dumps the rock out of the ring to eliminate him that's 11 eliminations for kane in this match uh and kane lasted 53 minutes yep. over 53 minutes yep for a like usually that spots a jericho mysterio benoit yeah i think uh Triple H has had it too, but Kane's a fucking big dude, yep. and he lasted almost an hour. Oh, I know. Um, Austin charges, and if you guys remember this, this, this Royal Rumble at this point, if you guys watch Austin, his I think his right boot is completely untied. So my man is rolling <laughs> around the ring with like one boot on. Um, so Austin charges in. Uh, Kane catches him and hits a huge choke slam. 
Austin's full of blood while Kane's been in this match for over 50 minutes at this point. Uh, Austin hits Kane with a low blow that JR calls an XFL like punt. Um, I'm pretty sure this is the only rumble with an XFL reference. Um, <laughs> Kane rolls out to the floor to grab a steel chair. Austin kicks it out of his hands. And after a struggle where Austin avoided uh, a tombstone, Austin hits a great stone cold stunner. Uh, Austin hits Kane with three consecutive chair shots to the skull. Um, Jesus. Kane stumbles back into the ropes and Austin clotheslines him. A hell of a clothesline uh, over the top rope and out of the ring to win the match. The crowd went bonkers. They went banana. Uh, mm-hmm. Rest in peace, Pat Patterson. The <laughs> crowd went nuts, man. Um, you know, JR is literally having an outer body experience, um, yelling Stone Cold 15 <laughs> times. Stone Cold's going to WrestleMania. By God, they're on their feet in New Orleans. The toughest son of a bitch in the WWF has done it. And that is why JR is the best ever, folks. <laughs> um <laughs> The match ended just over an hour, um, 61 minutes and 55 seconds. So, uh, it, it, so to, you know, the person that lasted the longest, 53, just about 54 minutes Kane lasted, dude. Yeah, um, 53, 46, I think it was. Yep. 53, 46. Exactly. Um, most eliminations was Kane with 11, um, best performance. How about booking him as strong as they did? Oh my he gosh. that long. 11 eliminations, and it takes a stunner and three chair shots to get him out of the ring. Oh, I, I agree. Um, so my random thoughts on, on this rumble was it was a really good – it was a great rumble. Smart booking from start to finish, which Barone said at the top of the show. Um, I enjoyed so many different aspects of Kane's dominance to the hardcore action, Big Show's attack on The Rock, the Kane Undertaker domination, um, Austin fighting back from the attack at the hands of Triple H, and then the finish. Uh, where Kane eliminated Rock, even though I thought Austin would be the one to do that. Um, I, I don't think there was a whole lot. I, I would have changed booking this. Like you even said it was the best booked Royal Rumble. Looking back, dude, even the dumb spots with Drew Carey, and I wouldn't even call the Honky Tonk Man a dumb spot, but even those spots, they made sense, and it, it didn't it, go too long. No, nah, they were done well. Like you said, it, it wasn't overly pushed. Like honky tonk man comes out, grabs the mic, cuts a quick promo, starts singing, guitar to the head. He's out before the next guy comes. Like it's a perfect spot. Uh, Haku makes his return here, which <laughs> yeah. is like, yeah, I think it was kind of a lot of people were like, I think I kind of remember him, you know? I mean, he wasn't like a massive, massive star, but still kind of cool to see another guy come back, but he worked. Yeah. You know, he didn't just come back and get hit with a chair or a uh, hit with a guitar. Yeah. But uh, and- yeah, I think laid out start to bottom this match is perfectly done i love this i love this royal rumble i agree and then you look at the point and and you know i I wrote down where i thought watching the match even back then i was like oh okay well the naturally if you're gonna go with austin rock at wrestlemania give them another reason to hate each other you know have austin eliminate the rock they didn't do that but why i think it worked is is you know the way they booked kane as such a monster was phenomenal and it benefited austin in the end because he was, he was the most dominant person in the history of the Rumble at that point. Eliminated 11 guys, 53 minutes of action. He didn't take too many bumps, um, which I was cool with that because it made him look real strong at the end. Um, and, and it's not like they booked him so strong that it hurt the match. It helped the match, I believe, because Austin eliminated him, which made Austin look like a badass at that point. Yeah. It also made Kane look great because it took three chair shots to the head to get him out of the ring. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I thought it was it was perfect. Um, there were a lot of fun moments here. I liked how the first third of the match was a hardcore style. That's different for a rumble. Um I also like the Drew Carey thing, like we just said. It was silly, but it was funny. Um, you know, you have an hour long match, so you need to have lighthearted moments in there. Um, if you do it early in the match, it works because the last half, like you said, uh, is usually the more serious part. Um, I liked how the battle between Austin Rock and Kane at the end lasted over five minutes. Uh, let them tell a story because they were the ones that carried the entire match. Um, yeah. You know, you had Kane's dominant story, Austin overcoming the odds as a babyface, uh, and The Rock was trying to recover from Big Show's uh, uh, choke slam for the table. Um, but man, the crowd reaction for Austin Rock was fantastic. Like we haven't had anything since then. You really haven't. No, nothing like that. Um, not at all. Not like that. 
you'll get yeah. like pops here and there, but nothing like that rivalry and how the crowd was into both of them. Mm-hmm. And they were both huge baby faces, but I loved how the rock could just change it. And in a night he could go from love baby face to hated heel. He was that yeah. good. Absolutely. And my, my, my last thing here of my thoughts um, before I give you my, you know, my rating of, of the actual rumble um, this might've been, and, and Barone mentioned it before I did. This is probably Jim Ross's best performance I've ever heard. He was yelling by the end of it and he made you care. It wasn't forced. Mm-hmm. Like it felt real. Um, you know, that's why he's the best ever because he made you care. Uh, and that's what, that's what wrestling announcers are supposed to do. Not like yeah. Michael Cole, who makes you want to mute the television. Yeah, um, and you can tell it's clearly the scripted lines and stuff that's fed to him, which, you know, I give Cole a lot of shit for fucking things up, but I know Vince is in his ear constant, constantly, and he really can't have these, like, um, from-the-heart moments like uh, Jerry Lawler and Jim Ross used to have because they didn't want to know what was going to happen. Right. Where at this, it's like everything's laid out. You know every single second what's going on mm-hmm. but uh yeah this is just like it's you know we we all say jim ross is the best commentator ever oh you know? for sure um my best performers um i think you would agree with all these three kane obviously the rock and people don't mention this man very good work by the people's champ here he almost hit 40 minutes in the rumble yeah he was in the second longest so yeah um, and obviously Austin, he spent most of this match selling because of the blood and it made his comeback work to a T. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that was great. So my match rating overall is probably a, to me, it was a five-star rumble. Um, it's only the second rumble to reach, um, you know, a five, a four or five-star level in the wrestling observer. Um, at that point, uh, with the Royal rumble of 92 ahead of it, which Barone also mentioned at the top of the show, um, they did an excellent job of putting Austin over as the winner, um, but also making Kane and the rock look like big stars that were on Austin's level based on performance. Um, mm-hmm. I also like, like we talked about the unique nature of the weapons. Um, it was just literally, man, sometimes you go like, man, that rumble was an hour. Jeez. It had some really bad spots, but not this one. 61, 62 minutes, almost nonstop. Great. Yeah. There's, and like I said, there's great spots where they like kind of do a reset with the Hardys go out. Drew Carey, it's kind of a little reset. Then Kane, then it's a hardcore match in Honky Tonk Man. It's a reset. You know, um, yeah, there are a lot of great. It's, it's, I said it top to bottom. It's my favorite Rumble. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's the best one. No, I, 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 I agree with you totally. Um, well, that, that wraps up the 2001 Royal Rumble. Our next one that we're going to talk about. Uh, not not tonight. It's okay. Don't worry. Uh, it's going to be the 2004 Royal Rumble. We chose that because one, I was in attendance. It was at the Phil. It was at the Wachovia Center, now the Wells Fargo Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, January 25th, 2004. A sellout of 17,300 people. Um, so this was a big, actually a really big pay per view. Uh, you had Evolution, uh, which was Batista and Ric Flair defeated the uh, you know defeated the Dudley Boys. Um, for the tag championships. We'll get into that. Um, Eddie Guerrero and Chavo Guerrero, uh, Brock Lesnar broke hardcore Holly's friggin' neck. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was a, it was because this match happened because Brock broke hardcore Holly's neck. Um, <laughs> uh, Triple H versus Shawn Michaels in a last man standing match, uh, a bloody friggin' mess. This match was, um, and then a, a ghost won the uh, Royal rumble match starting from number one, which you won't hear WWF ever recognize again. Ever. They always nope. talk, they say like uh, only X amount of guys have won it from one. Shawn Michaels being one of them, but they never mentioned Chris Benoit no. being one of the other guys. It's, it's pretty funny. No, and Chris Benoit, by the way, guys, lasted 61 minutes. <laughs> to win this rumble match and um well that was the year of, of the rabid wolverine and we'll definitely go into that um and also the, the 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 people that were in that rumble man what a card that was uh going that rumble so we'll talk about that one next and then we'll go into 2007 after that and then we'll jump to 2015 correct because barone was uh, live and in living color in Philadelphia Pennsylvania um for for that yeah. one which was also a phenomenal show um, I thought it so gets anyway. a lot of shit because because Roman won. 
That's yeah. the only reason. But if you break it down and ignore that, it's actually a really good show. Yeah. And look, as much as the crowd hated it, it sounded badass on television because mm-hmm. the crowd was hot. Um, yeah. So that was good. Uh, all right. This has been the Nerd Enthusiast Wrestling Podcast. Uh, if you guys want to check out everything else we got going on, Nerd Enthusiast on YouTube. Uh, check out Nerd Enthusiast on Instagram, eh? uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook. Uh, they're doing giveaways quite often. So check that out. I don't know when this show is going to get posted. So I'm not sure if they're going to have a giveaway uh, happening. I know there's one going on now. Um, but uh, he just, uh, Matt pops them up there. Uh, quite frequently, so definitely check them out. Head to patreon.com slash nerd enthusiast uh, to, to help um, you know contribute to the show to help us keep growing. Uh, we have a couple other good shows, man. We have the gaming show led by Matt. We have the poker show with our, our, our boys Keen and uh, Mr. Sakali. Uh, check that all out as well, and we got more things coming down the pike. Um, check us we out. We have exclusive uh, Patreon content coming at you too. Absolutely. Little quick, quick videos were uh, Chris and I discussed, we'll dive into the more controversial and edgy, edgy shit yeah. that mm-hmm. WWF did. Like, and the first thing that came to our heads was Katie. Triple H <laughs> dressed as Kane, <laughs> fucking a corpse. Oh, so boy. It'll be stuff like that we'll get into. Uh, but that'll be Patreon exclusive content. So if you guys want to hear it, mm-hmm. give us a couple dollars. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There, there was no penetration, pal. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's all right. It's acceptable for television. Um, <laughs> uh, can't wait to talk about that stuff, man. That's going to be good. And uh, like we said, next show will be the 2004 Royal Rumble from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, can't wait to talk about that with you guys. Uh, for Kyle Barone, I am Chrissy Francesco. Uh, hope Have a great uh, rest of your week and weekend and have a good one. Bye-bye.